Hello everyone and welcome to this video which is in our engine opening series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are continuing our exploration of the 7 D take C5 line against the Queen's Gambit accepted and uh, in this video we're going to be looking at it um, from the white point of view. We're going to try and understand you know what are white's assets, why does white feel that uh, that he can play for, um, uh, for a win, what are black's weaknesses and also yeah how do you uh, how do you do it? How do you develop? And uh, well, I can tell you there are a lot of development schemes for white. Um, and then in subsequent videos, we'll also have a look at it from the black point of view. Just uh, how did how does black defend? What should black be aiming for? Now let's just give you a little introduction. How does the opening arise? It's uh, 1d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, knight f3, knight f6, e3, e6, bishop c4, c5 castles a6 and now the move d takes c5 and as i said i got triggered to uh, uh to look at this uh, opening because uh, uh, alexandra uh, goryachkina played this against uh, humbi kuneru in the uh, the last round of the uh, delhi grand prix and uh, yeah just seemed interesting so you know every opening has a variation that makes your heart sink a little when it's played against you and for french players it's the exchange french i think knight or sicilian players feel that when they get a 2c3 Sicilian or a bishop b5 check Sicilian against them and uh, you know for Queen's Gambit accepted players um, yeah d takes c5 is is very much in this category you know uh, the resulting sim symmetry coupled with the exchange of Queens makes it hard for um, for black to entertain any thoughts of a win whilst uh, you know rather irritatingly white has a number of small pluses that um, well you know require some care from black now it was first played in 1911 by a very strong Russian player Grigory Livenfish though he must have been quite uh, young at the time and um, was played for a long time either as a way of making a quick draw or in a fairly stereotypical way with a3 and b4 and I'll, I'll just show you that first game because um, yeah it's quite uh, similar to what uh, yeah, people did for the next uh, uh, 60 or 70 years so um, here this was uh, Levenfish against uh, Teichmann in 1911 um, takes bishop takes c5 and then white plays the move a3 just trying to expand on the queen side well black plays the king to the center puts the bishop to d6 which is a, a pretty good square for the bishop covering the e5 square and not getting in the way of anything else and after bishop b2 we play b5 the bishop went back to b3 which is a little bit strange normally the bishop would go back to um, uh, to e2 in this position maybe to emerge to uh, f3 later try and weaken some of those uh, queenside light squares but knight e5 rook d8 knight d2 knight d7 and we get some exchanges and uh, well essentially the position is looking completely equal here and uh, Teichmann uh, defended it uh, perfectly fine and uh, scored an easy draw and uh, well you see a lot of white play like this just playing a3 and b4 but um, um, well yeah th there's more ways of uh, of, uh, of playing this and that's what we're going to have a look at here now if you're looking at um, you know famous exponents of this line uh, players whose games you might want to follow well Boris Spassky is um, um, is the main one and then from uh, from my era Vladimir Kramnik and Yevgeny Bereyev were the main propagators of this move and they uh, discovered a lot of interesting ideas I think in particular Bereyev was uh, was very good for this um, in very modern times so Wesley So has played quite a lot though strangely enough with a minor score in my database he's lost one game and drawn seven and um, I think definitely worth mentioning uh, two strong players uh, Daniel Friedman and Vladimir Malenyuk who've um, also made very good scores with it um, so uh, yeah those players are definitely worth uh, following if you want to uh, um, if you want to, to know more about it so just going to have a look first of all at uh, queen takes d1 rook d1 bishop c5 um this has been one of the major lines for uh, for black nowadays the engines are taking on c5 immediately so that's become de facto the uh, the main line but uh, this one is well worth um uh, looking at and it makes it quite clear really what white's got in this position and what black has got so um looking at this you know white obviously seems to have a couple of extra uh, tempi in development um, castling uh, the king and also rook d1 in addition to the advantage of the first move and by contrast black has got this move a7 to a6 and this is something of a mixed blessing for black now on the positive side it covers 
um, b5 against uh, knight c3 to b5. Um, and it also supports queenside development with b5 and bishop b7. Very typical queen's gambit accepted play. However, what you do have to say is that this move b5, when you're playing it in an ending like this, um, is a little double-edged. It creates weaknesses on uh, a5 and c5, and it can also be undermined with the move a2 to a4. So, and, you know, a2 to a4, you'll swap off uh, white's a pawn for the b pawn, and it'll leave black with a weak pawn on a6. And, well, if you don't believe that's a problem, then take a look at my previous video, and you might get an idea. Um, so, also, you know, on the negative side of a6, it weakens um, this queenside square b6. And actually, the weak queenside uh, dark squares are really the crux of white's whole play, potential play in this position. Black has got some sensitive dark squares, particularly uh, b6 and also d6 as well. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, why would they be sensitive? Well, let's show you um, one typical example here. Very famous game, uh, just searching for it, so bear with me. It's Spassky Fischer from the, the later match in 1992. Um, I'll just show you how that game uh, proceeded. The, you know, the opening moves are not so important, but more the situation in which Fischer ended up. So b3 was played by uh, Spassky. That was his favourite, bishop b2. Not the most critical nowadays. b6 from Fischer, very important uh, black idea here. Actually, I think it's an idea that I first uh, came up with. That's my uh, feeling in uh, these Queen's Gambit accepted positions. I, I really play them a lot. It was my main opening as a professional. Just uh, not playing b5, but developing the bishop, playing b6, keeping control of, some control of the queenside dark squares. So knight c3 played by uh, Spassky, actually looking to exploit that a little bit, um, looking to play knight a4 possibly, um, because black hasn't played b5. But bishop b7, rook c1, bishop e7, knight d4, rook c8, f3. And now Fischer played very concretely actually, it was quite good play for a while. Bishop b2, bishop c5, so just coming back, um, stopping the, um, uh, the white knight from coming to a4 and bringing the bishop back to c5 now that the pawn on e3 has been weakened. King f1, king e7, e4. Um, as we'll see, this is a pretty uh, typical idea for white. Set up that um, wall of pawns on f3 and e4 and try and make this bishop on b7 completely passive. But actually, uh, Fischer reacted very aggressively here and Spassky came up with a bit of a weird... Um, reaction here with um, with bishop a3 and now if um, Fischer had just played bishop a3 knight a3 then probably something like h5 I guess his position would have been pretty good actually you know it's uh, uh, some nice uh, queenside play the white pieces are not really coordinating very well but he played the uh, the move b4 and he'd missed a tactic but the resulting situation now really demonstrates the weakness of uh, black's uh, uh, queenside dark squares if they get exposed because Fischer, uh, Spassky rather, played this gorgeous idea rook takes c5 and then bishop b4 exchange sacrifice, pretty typical but now these knights are coming in and this knight's coming into c4 and all of these squares are very very sensitive so takes takes, knight d7, knight c4 bishop a, king f2 rook g8, h4 and actually black's just paralyzed all due to the weaknesses of uh, of these um, uh, dark squares you know the king's got to be very careful because a knight can come into d6 for example so rook c7 knight c2 played rook b8 bishop a3 h5 rook g1 king f6 king e3 rook g5 more dark squares b5 more dark squares again you know we've got moves like uh, b6 for example knight bc5 knight d4 <coughs> and again you know just just no way for black to get free we've got more breakthroughs on the b6 uh, square happening and c5 very hard to hold this uh, this knight somehow so well uh, fisher played e5 but after takes takes rook f5 and rook takes e5 just everything was collapsing but again you can see it's that exchange sacrifice that you know really exposed the um uh, the black queen side dark squares and then they really turned out to be unbelievably weak you know and this is uh, you know really something very very uh, um uh, important to remember that uh, you know there's this latent weakness of the black queen side dark squares is really one big thing that white is playing for in uh, in this position
Now, here, of course, you know, uh, this was uh, just exploited by um, uh, a tactical mistake of Fisher's, and, you know, White got rid of that um, that dark squared bishop uh, on c5 and uh, exploited it with his own dark squared bishop. But actually, normally, White isn't, you know, ne necessarily able to do that. But what White is going to do, White is going to exploit those squares, b6 and d6, with the knights. And um, this is one of the um, this is really one of the big discoveries that was made, you know, by uh, by players like uh, Bayrev and Kramnik, uh, especially, you know, about what you could do with these um, with these knights. And what it's actually meant is that um, 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 white players now have basically tended to delay the development of this uh, dark squared bishop here. So not play a quick a3 b4 or b3 bishop b2, and instead maneuver around with the knights. And um, we've got two great out, two great setups for them. Um, and putting the knights on d on c4 and d3, or c4 and b3 in particular. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you um, a few examples of this, just so that you get some uh, some nice ideas here. Let's start off with a game, um, and this is uh, Berev against Shirov from uh, uh, the FIDE uh, World Championship knockout in uh, Delhi, Tehran, 2000. So we get knight bd2, and then the move b6, and now bishop e2. Now this is a very key point of um, of white's play. The bishop is brought back from c4 to e2. Why are you doing this? Well, the bishop isn't doing a great deal on c4. You get out of the way of uh, b7 to b5, and you're also freeing c4 for the white knight. I love this very much. You know, somehow white curls up into a ball, and then afterwards the knights sort of spring expand like an umbrella. So um, uh, bishop b7 played knight c4. Now we see this uh, these knights actually uh, aiming, of course, at the d6 square. Knight bd7, um, and I do believe that um, this is actually a mistake because we can actually trap this rook with uh, bishop d5 and then we're going to follow up with knight e4 or king e7. So you don't want to do that. So that's why black can play knight bd7. But here, Beret have played the move knight d4. Very interesting idea here. Castles, knight b3, bishop e7. And what you're seeing is that, you know, these two knights, this setup of these two knights is absolutely great. This knight's attacking b6 and d6. Um, this knight has driven the bishop away from c5, and both knights are ready to jump into a5 if black ever tries and plays the move b5. So it's kind of difficult for black to, you know, to, to get free somehow. And white's next moves, these are really important. These are really part of the plan. Remember them. White plays the move f3 here. And uh, what is White's idea? White's idea is to play e4. Now, we've already seen this. Blocking out this bishop on b7, making it bite uh, against granite along the a8h1 diagonal. Very typical in the Queen's Gambit accepted. And then afterwards, the bishop is going to come to e3. And we're going to attack the pawn on b6. And what is black going to do? Well, you can, if you try and defend it, you're really going to be passive. If you play b5, we get the knight into a5. And then we've also got the c5 square to uh, to attack, and we'll also have a4 once the pawn comes to b5. So this is really this whole scheme. Knight into c4, drive away the bishop from c5, f3, e4, the bishop comes into e3. And, uh, well, what you see in this game is that, uh, well, Shirov uh, feels the need to... Um, um, to uh, to drive away the white knight on uh, on b3 with a5 to a4, but what does this lead to? Well, it gives white another square for the knight on b5, and the engines still say that this is you know tenable for black. It's not uh, uh, awful, awful. You know, black still in the realm of slight um, uh, disadvantage here, but I think you know already you feel with black that you're really under pressure, and that you've been forced to make weaknesses, and white's got new soft spots to come in with the uh, with the pieces. So that is a very nice, um, um, a very nice um, line here. Um, let me just take you back and give you another example of this uh, from the games of Vladimir Malanyuk, who uh, I mentioned before. So this is a, Ma a Malanyuk game, and uh, actually I wonder whether this was a, a template for what Vladimir Kramnik later did against Garry Kasparov in their World Championship match. Again, we see the knight coming back to e2. We see the knight coming to d4, so not coming round to d2 to c4. Um, uh, here Malignuk just plays the knight to d4 and plays to set up this, um, uh, this uh, uh, structure with f3, e4. Now the bishop comes to e3, the king comes to f2, and now very nice manoeuvre. What are we going to do? 
That's right, the knight's coming round to d2. This knight now will swap round to b3, and this knight will come round to c4. Now, I think you're probably starting to get an idea here that white's, the way that white puts those knights on b3 and c4, for example, is incredibly flexible. You know, you can play, um, you can do it in all sorts of ways. And this is kind of the difficulty for black, that um, you can come up with a development scheme against one thing, and then you'll just uh, get hit by another one here. So knight e5 played knight b3, hitting uh, the pawn on b6. Rook c6, rook c1, h3. The knight went back to d7. We got knight c4. And now this is starting to get a little bit awkward for black. Um, in the uh, game between uh, Kramnik and uh, Kas uh, Kasparov, by the way, uh, Gary was very, very careful to keep this knight on e5. He still lost in the end, but um, that part at least he got absolutely right. Um, now for knight c4, yeah, how are you going to get rid of this knight? Very, very difficult. If you play b5, we'll play knight a5. So bishop c8 played, and now a4. So if black plays b5 now, you're going to end up with an isolated pawn on b5, which is very easy to attack. e5, rook c1. We're already looking at uh, ideas like knight takes b6 here, for example. So b5 was played. Takes, takes. Bishop a6, knight c6. Bishop d6, knight a2. And it's very, very hard for, uh, for black to defend this uh, b5 pawn. In actual fact, black didn't manage it in this position. This happened. And Malanyuk was winning very easily against his 2300 opponent with no stress, completely easy. You know, that's the beauty of, um, of this line. So this is, um, um, you know, a very good example of this knight on b3, knight on c4 setup. And, uh, well, as you can see, you can uh, aim for it directly or in a roundabout way. It doesn't really seem to, uh, to matter at all. Now, um, you know, another, I think another great example and uh, useful on a channel with, uh, with engines is Kramnik, Vladimir Kramnik's win against Deep Fritz in Bahrain in 2002. Looking back on it, uh, an, a more impressive achievement than uh, you gave uh, Vladimir credit for, because uh, although Deep Fritz wasn't the strongest at the time, it was still obviously very, very strong. So um, here Kramnik played the move king f1 in this position, which was uh, actually meant to, uh, to take uh, deep fritz out of book. And, uh, but here again, uh, Kramnik played this uh, maneuver knight d2 to b3. Not playing the pawn to b3 and playing bishop b2 gives black the opportunity to exploit you know, these weak queenside dark squares. And at the time, Fritz was not particularly um, attuned in to, uh, to these sort of weaknesses. He played bishop f8, which is quite an impressive move. And now a4, b4, and knight d2. And well, here we are. You see what's happening. These knights are moving round to c4. Uh, the engines nowadays are saying, you know, completely lost for, uh, for black here. Minus, t you know, plus, plus 2.3 or something for, uh, for white. So, yeah, you know, engines got stronger in our days. But um, you see what's happening here again. Knight on b3, knight on c4. Again, very strong setup. And uh, yeah, you know, this was actually completely winning for um for Kramnik although yeah struggled somewhat to um uh, to put it away but got there uh, in the end um but again you know this uh, this structure of um of um uh, knight on b3 and knight on uh, c4 very very strong and um well i haven't shown you something with uh, a knight on d3 and a knight on c4 i can just show you one famous example here just going back to knight bd2 b6 bishop e2 bishop b7 knight c4 knight d7 and now the move b3 this was actually uh, a game uh, kramnik against karpov uh, in 1999 and uh, yeah Kramnik defeated Karpov in this line and um, well king e7 was played bishop b2 rook d8 and now knight e1 and uh, yeah this knight is coming round to d3 here and again we're going to catch this dark squared bishop and it's quite nasty with the king being on e7 so you know Karpov played b5 knight a5 Bishop f3, pretty typical from white um, I mentioned this uh, idea exchange off the light squared bishops um, and just give yourself access to these weak light squares and now knight d3 and well after Karpov allowed this um yeah he had some big trouble here because uh, well basically you know all of these queen side squares dark squares and light were an easy prey for uh, for white's pieces and uh, obviously we've got a weak a6 pawn as well and Kramnik won this uh, this ending very convincingly against uh, Karpov now, one thing that we've just seen in that last game, and actually that um, is kind of a theme, we also saw it in Spassky-Fischer, um, was um, the 
position of the Black King on e7. And, um, you know, when you look at what the engines recommend uh, against the DC line, they recommend this. And, you know, at first sight, this is actually really attractive because, um, you know, after all, we're in an endgame, aren't we? Well, it's a queenless middle game. But, you know, in an endgame, you want your king as close to the center as possible. So why would you castle kingside? Why wouldn't you just uh, allow... Um, you know, white to remove the uh, the right of castling because you're going to come with your king on e7, and, and that also feels like you're catching up with um, um, white's uh, development advantage because you know white's got these extra move castles and uh, and rook d1 in the other line. Well, if we allow our king, to, if we can put our king on the center straight away, it's like we've already you know gained time castling and then playing king f8 to e7. It feels like we're almost maybe up in tempi. Yeah, I mean the the, the big worry about having the king on e7. Um, is simply that um, once the king comes to uh, to e7 here, then um, um, it's on a dark square, and it's also blocking the retreat of the bishop on c5 back to e7, which means that when this bishop gets hit, it might have some difficulties. And um, um, there's also the possibility of the black king being checked along the a3, f8 diagonal. Um, sounds a bit, uh, maybe doesn't sound quite concrete enough. Let's have a look at, a, at an example here. This is um, uh, the game uh, Bindrich against Springer uh, from Bilbao, 2014. King e7, b3, b6, bishop e2 once again. And now knight e1. And just notice here, white's keeping the bishop on c1, not developing yet, and just bringing this knight round to d3. And then sproink, we get our uh, expansion here. Knight c4 and bishop a3 check and rook c1. And, you know, again, although the engines say, yeah, you know, this is tenable for black, it's all right, this feels very uncomfortable for black. You know, I played this position against Leela one node as well, and, uh, you know, it just, not, it just doesn't give you a good feeling here when uh, your king's uh, caught like this. This bishop is on the, uh, you know, the same line as the, uh, the knight. Bishop f3 is coming in. You know, it's, it's kind of nasty, really, for, um, for, um, uh, for white, uh, for black here. Um, let me give you um, another example here. Um, that's white playing 9b3. This is uh, Almeida Quintana against uh, Alain Pichot, very strong player as, uh, as black, uh, in a rapid game here. Um, knight e5. Uh, Why knight e5? Well, actually, uh, it gives white uh, just like a little bit of irritation factor. We're uh, aiming along this diagonal. And also, of course, from e5, the knight can come back to d3. Yet another way of, uh, of setting up this uh, setup. You know, we've got knight e1 to d3. We've got knight e5 to d3. If you're a white player here, you've got all the options and you can just confuse black. You know, that's uh, very nice indeed. And here, the you know, actually black realizes that this bishop has got caught because uh, bishop d6, we can go knight c4. And if bishop c7, we go bishop a3. And somehow black's been tricked here and we'll be getting in uh, moves like knight d6 or bishop d6 you know uh, depending where the uh, the black king moves so black plays rook hd8 um we go knight c4 rook c8 but this bishop is caught and this is kind of a nasty position for uh, for black here um we've got um this pawn on c5 we've got a great knight on c4 blockading it and we've still got our dark squared bishop to attack it and of course this knight is also doing some damage on the on the dark squares as well and this just turned out to be you know, an absolutely beautiful position. Um, this move f3 coming in again. Um, very nice little uh, idea here, just bringing the bishop round to f2 here, just attacking this pawn on c5. Bishop f1, rook b1. So beautiful, you know, this is great play with the bishops, really. Keep the bishops, you know, just back. They're still very powerful. Whether they're on e2 or f1, they're incredibly powerful, but you just keep them out of the way of the um, of the uh, of the black knights, you know, and when you play e4 eventually and black goes knight d4, you're not attacking a bishop on e2. And well, here, after e5, knight b6 was played, knight a4, and bang, that pawn is disappearing. And again, White's achieved a win against a very strong player, over 2,600 player, with zero fuss, zero stress. You know, uh, it's really uh, very, very nice indeed. And then maybe um, a very nice uh, game to uh, to show you here is this one. I'll show you why it's a nice game afterwards. So Bishop B2 played straight away. 
Um, King e7, knight fd2. So again, um, you know, just a very um, uh, a very unusual way of playing it. Actually, what you're doing here, you're playing the knight round to b3, and you're actually keeping an idea like knight c3 to a4 in reserve if you want. So very, very interesting. Um, you know, the ancients aren't particularly impressed with it, but that doesn't matter because you're playing against human players somehow. So bishop d6, and now we come round knight d2. Knight c4, and now bishop d2. This is a nice idea, just looking for bishop b4 check. So the knight comes to c6. In principle, um, I always say in the Queen's Gambit accepted, you don't want to put a knight on c6 in front of this bishop. You want to play it round to d7. But that would just get hit by bishop b4 check. So you've, you know, you've got something there. And now rook fc1, rook d8, and now a4. This is very strong play from uh, from the Chinese player Zhang Yi Tan, who's, uh, whose games we saw uh, in the Women's Candidates final. Got a whole video series on that if you're, uh, if you're interested. So uh, do take a look at that. Um, rook c8, and now in this game, this was Zhongyi Tan against Mamadova in uh, 2022, I think, so a recent game. Zhongyi Tan played bishop e1, which is quite natural, getting it out of this attack. But uh, in my engine games, uh, Stockfish against Dragon played the move a5. Um, and after um, this move, knight takes a5 of Dragon's, bishop b4 check, yeah, this nasty check, just uh, putting the king to a, an awkward square there on e8. Stockfish took, took. Knight a5, bishop a5, bishop takes a5, rook c1, rook c1. Are you starting to see this? I hope, I hope you are. Because after takes, 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 bishop c3, we are back into um, um, what I actually devoted the whole of the last video on. This position and this amazing ending that uh, Stockfish demonstrated that this is a forced win for white, uh, this position. Um, but I hope you can see, you know, just standard uh, methods from uh, from White here, manoeuvring with a knight, slightly different uh, setup, bishop coming to the uh, a3 f8 diagonal to exploit that king on e7, and we end up in this position, which is just a theoretical win. Take a look at, um, at my previous video on the Queen's Gambit Accepted, Stockfish's end, end game magic to uh, if you haven't seen it, because uh, if you want to play this line with White, this is the sort of stuff you've got to know. So there we are. I mean, those are the dangers of having the black king on e7. In principle, it's a great idea. Save tempi, you know, compensate for white's advantage in tempi with getting your king to the center. But don't underestimate the risks of uh, this bishop not having a retreat square on e7 and the bishop getting hit by white's knights in all sorts of uh, configurations there. Um, and then a bishop checking on the diagonal and then these weak squares on d6 and b6. You know that is um, really what um, what White is um, is playing for there. Um, do I have anything else that I want to show you on this line from the White point of view? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think this is this is basically uh, you know the the uh, the whole thing really. Um, so this is why White feels that um, that he's got an edge with D takes C five and why he can play this for a win. Um, what we're going to do in the next video, we're going to have a look actually at uh, Black's best lines uh, against this and how Black can try and neutralise White's play. And uh, well, you know, I hope that'll uh, give then uh, both sides uh, a good grounding uh, in the line. And uh, well, you know, we'll uh, hopefully make uh, better Queen's Gambit accepted players of you uh, from both colours, from the white side and from the black side. But I hope you can see that... Uh, um, you know, despite the fact that it's a symmetrical position and the queens are off, you know, white really does have a lot of little ideas, a lot of uh, interesting um, ways of development that can, you know, cause black a lot of headaches if black isn't properly prepared. So there we are. Hope you enjoyed that. If you enjoyed that video, why not give a like, subscribe to the channel, spread the word, take a look at my new book, The Silicon Road to Chess Improvement, which is well, basically, you know, full of... Uh, of uh, yeah, insight and thoughts like this, you know, helped by uh, by engines and also with plenty of ideas for how to use your engines to make analysis and uh, and insights like this. And otherwise, you know, thanks very much for watching and hope to see you at the next videos. Thanks for watching.